Hello, I'm Davide Berardi, and uh, I am a PhD at University of Bologna. I was a firmware engineer for the two last years. So, uh, and in this presentation, we will talk about uh, um, memory corruption. So, this is a, an introduction to memory corruption, how the Linux operating system, not just the kernel, handles them. So, uh, first of all, I want to talk why I'm talking about uh, memory corruption in 2018. So, uh, in the age of uh, Spectre, in the side channel, um, other kind of attacks, uh, we are talking about memory corruption because it's a real thing. I, I've read uh, in these days uh, a paper by Thomas Dulian which uh, um, states that memory corruption uh, can, memory corruption exploit and exploitability can be proved. So, uh, that can, some uh, some uh, compiler uh, extension can be developed uh, to uh, analyze memory corruption uh, and this kind of vulnerability. But in this uh, in this era, some memory corruption uh, are present, uh, like in the browsers, uh, like in Firefox, uh, like in Google Chrome, uh, as we see them here. So we will talk about that uh, here by this uh, this kind of thing. So uh, we will talk about also about spooky stories. Uh, maybe all of you know the right, the guy on the right here, which is uh, Spectre, the side channel mitigation, the side channel attacks that exit this year. But less of you maybe know the guy on the left, uh, which is um, Ghost, uh, which was a vulnerability of the uh, GNU libc in 2015, which was a memory corruption vulnerability. So that's uh, it's a real problem. That's uh, the, um, the memory corruption vulnerability we're going to talk about. So an introduction uh, to buffer overflow problematics uh, and uh, memory corruption. In C, when we uh, declare some variables, uh, like in this case is uh, the A variable, which is an integer, and the B variable, which is an array of four charts, we'll, go, uh, we'll get in our memory choose lots uh, here. I, I didn't uh, write it where is the high part of the memory, the low part of the memory, because that is relevant to, to this kind of attacks we're going to talk about. So uh, we, will have, we will have some, um, some variables allocated by this, uh, in this way. And when we call a function, we are obviously have a activation record which is uh, constructed in a similar way to this. So we have local parameters, the return address, uh, which is very important, the save state of the function, and the local variables. What is a memory corruption? A memory corruption, for example, comes in when we have uh, something like that, which combines uh, um, variables and uh, our activation record. And then we have uh, a vulnerable function. In this case, it's the get s, which uh, takes uh, an input a string and uh, uh, doesn't check uh, if the array um, go out of bounds. Uh, so it uh, goes in the memory, right in the memory, right up uh, in, our, uh, in our stacks. So if we start to provide some input to the get s, we can provide, for example, for a to uh, our, our b variable. So the value of b get loaded uh, with uh, our inputs. And because the get s, as we, uh, we say uh, in this moment, doesn't check any memory bounds, we can continue to provide inputs to our programs. Then we can override, some, uh, override the, the remaining part of memory, and then we got uh, um, we override in the return address. Let's assume that we now mm, stop the input provided to the get s uh, and uh, it the return address. In this case, we get a segmentation fault. I think that everyone in this room uh, had a segmentation fault in his life. So um, that's a memory corruption. We have corrupted memory to um, and get some exception by the, the systems, uh, which tell us, uh, OK, you've write it in a part of memory you, you which you can't, or you jumped in a part of memory which was not executable, something like that. So um, how we can exploit that? You, you can exploit that using uh, something called uh, a shellcode. For example, this is a shellcode. I think that's not uh, readable, but um, this kind of shellcode, for example, uh, can be injected into the application. And then you can jump into this, uh, this piece of code to execute uh, um, the related assembly. So you have the, uh, this assembly code, which is uh, simply an implementation uh, of uh, this, 
one of these two functions. So you have, the, for example, this piece of code which uh, is executing, uh, um, executing being a Sage program. So you are executing a program, uh, um, a shell in your application. Uh, for example, if your program uh, have an IBGR privileges, uh, uh, or your program uh, is a network program which um, do something on a remote machine, you can exploit, the, exploit it using uh, a shellcode like, the, like the, the one which is presented here. So you inject this shellcode and then your application do what you want. So uh, how it works? Uh, it works by obviously overriding the values uh, in our uh, stack and then you place your shellcode as your, um, your buffer here. It is a little buffer, but if you have a, a bigger buffer, you can provide a, a bigger shellcode. And uh, you, uh, as the return address, uh, you provide the, the, an address into the shellcode, the start address of the shellcode. So you jump, you return from the function, and then your code get executed by using, by, from here. So you have executed code, uh, you have, uh, it's game over, uh, and uh, your application is compromised, you have uh, exploited a memory corruption, uh, but uh, the system can do something to prevent this kind of exploit. Yeah, there is a, a simple mitigation, which is active uh, in the most architecture we are using today, which is active in the Linux kernel, which are the NX, uh, Bit. It's an X bit. Uh, is a bit on um, on the processor. So you have uh, uh, you have uh, your memory areas which can be written or executed. You don't have uh, at the same time uh, the execution of the memory area or uh, the written of the memory area. So you can, for example, declare your stack as writable, and then you cannot execute your stack. So, so you maybe can put your uh, shellcode into your stack, into your buffer, but you will not, uh, um, you can't execute them by jumping into the, uh, the stack and then start to execute code which you provided to the application. And that you will get another stack fold, another um, processor exception uh, to block you from using this kind of attacks. But there are, uh, there are other kind of attacks. For example, you are writing on the, on the stack, uh, and so you can provide some uh, addresses to your application. So there are some attacks uh, like the return to libc, return to library, which you, in which you can provide some, uh, uh, only some addresses to your application, so you're not providing some executable code. You are using the executable code of the executable itself, so, or the shared library itself. So you, for example, place in the return address the address of the system function, which is a, a function to execute code, uh, execute a program uh, in, uh, using the shell. Then, you, for example, you provide a fake return address, uh, which uh, is uh, the next return address from this function, and then the address of VNSH. So you have constructed a fake, return, a fake activation record on your stack. So when you re will return from this function, uh, you will hit the address of system, you will go in the system function, and we will start to execute bnsh. When the bnsh return, you will hit fake return, and then you will have a segmentation fault, uh, or if you place exit uh, in, this, uh, in this code, you will exit from your code with, uh, it will exit from your, uh, your program with a good return address, or some, a good, uh, good return code, or something like that. And that's bring us to another kind of uh, uh, exploitation pattern, that is uh, return-oriented programming. If you, you can think about it and, think, uh, and say, okay, I will remove every function which can give me code execution, and uh, I, I will not put uh, some vulnerable code in my application, some, um, some function which can be exploited using uh, uh, the return to, the, to library code. But that is not a mitigation because uh, you can uh, uh, provide some little piece of code to, um, to program your machine. That's the concept of weird machine. So you, for example, in your code, you have, uh, you have programmed your machine to, to have uh, a, a specific behavior. But when you provide some malicious input, you can reprogram your machine to do something, uh, something new. Uh, this is the concept of the return-oriented programming. How return-oriented programming works. Um, it works by using this uh, uh, little piece of code. So uh, you have, for example, in your application, obviously 
um, when you have a return, you obviously have some uh, uh, assembly code before, uh, before that return, and you can jump to, um, to the previously uh, declared uh, um, piece of code. So, for example, in this case, uh, you will jump here in this, uh, um, in this piece of code, and you, will, uh, and you will execute this uh, uh, assembly function, and then you will return. If you chain this kind of gadget, you can program your machine. For example, in this case, in this case you're moving uh, 11, the value 11 in AIX, then you return, so you move uh, BNSH, the address of BNSH in the register ABX, moving the, uh, then you return uh, and then you jump to the next gadget, and then we, you will load the, the address of the address of BNSH in AIX, and then uh, after all you will, uh, you will uh, execute a uh, system call function, uh, so we, you, this code will execute the system being as we said before. So that's the, um, the concept of uh, return-oriented programming. Uh, return-oriented programming uh, was proven to be Turing complete, so you can, uh, um, you can do whatever you want with your code, uh, so you, you smash the stack and inject the code you want, so you can uh, uh, do anything with this code. Obviously, you'll need to have uh, a sufficient amount of gadgets in your application, so you, if you have uh, this, uh, this kind of thing, this kind of um, gadgets, uh, you can do everything you want with your application. My mining Bitcoin is not efficient, but you can do it. The first real kind of mitigation we have against this kind of attacks uh, is uh, SLR. SLR is... Um, an acronym for uh, address layout randomization. So your um, your library and your stack get get a random address every time you, you launch an application. In this example, we are launching uh, uh, UMI, and we see that the li the libc library here I have some strange color here. Uh, the libc library get loaded in a different address every time. So you can, for example, get your the address of uh, uh, the system function. Or you can, for example, get the address of your uh, your gadgets uh, uh, of your systems. Uh, there is an important concept uh, on SLR, which is uh, uh, which is the which random values the entropy of the system. So, for example, if you have a low entropy LSLR, you can uh, obviously predict which value will get the library C of. Um, with uh, obviously a uh, same range, uh, some range uh, at this point. The, uh, the entropy bits uh, of your uh, SLR uh, are shown by the kernel in this file. So if you could use this command, you see uh, how much bits are, uh, are reserved for SLR, um, SLR randomization. But SLR obviously can be, um, can be bypassed by some, uh, some attacks uh, that are, which are not memory uh, memory corruption, but uh, this kind of attacks which are information leak. The most simple kind of information leak is a printf parameter uh, leak. In this example, uh, you are using, uh, we are using printf by not providing, but not using a, mm, a preloaded format, a constant format, but we are using a user-provided format. So, for example, in um, in this program, we can pass hello to our program, and here we'll print hello. We, you can pass uh, percent %p, and the program will print the next address on the stack. So, for example, this is an address of your application. Or, for example, a token, if it was a, a token of your application, a, a password saved in your application, you can print um, your stack variables, uh, so you will get uh, an information leak. That can be a problem because you can print the address of uh, uh, some address of some function in your library code, recalculate some offsets, and then reconstruct your uh, return-oriented programming chain. So we, you will uh, um, you will get a return-oriented programming by summing this uh, summing the offset you got to your um, to your standard gadget to your gadget we are with a preloaded offset with a precalculated offset. Another Less obvious kind of information leak uh, uh, is tied to how SLR is implemented. Uh, upon a fork, uh, 
uh, SLR won't get uh, remapped, so address won't get remapped. In this example, we have compiled this code, and you get that the address of printf in the child uh, have the same address of the printf in the parent every time you uh, run your application. And that can be a problem. Why that can be a problem? Um, for example, in, uh, in Android, uh, the, the process scheme of Android, uh, which is Zygote, uh, I checked uh, a long time ago, but I'm sure that in Android 5 was, uh, this, uh, was vulnerable to these kind of things. So in, in Android 5, for example, uh, in Zygote, you fork your uh, interpreter and then your interpreter start to, um, start to run your application. So for example, you can, um, you can place an application on a, a target and then get some addresses by them. And then uh, you can, uh, for example, uh, launch a ROP over another application. There was a, that was a new thing in uh, Zygote. Uh, uh, Morula is an extension to Zygote to prevent this kind of attacks, uh, but was never set, I think. So um, this is present in, for example, Android uh, operating system. Another kind of, uh, um, of information leak uh, which can bypass SLR is uh, Spectra. Uh, Spectra is a bug uh, uh, on a different level from uh, the one we've spoken about, which uh, are all, all on, uh, on uh, software level. Uh, Spectra is uh, a hardware bug, so it's tied to branch prediction unit and cache. So um, I will present some uh, Spectra attack, uh, some simplified, obviously, high level uh, Spectra attack. You have uh, your cache here. And then you have your code, which, uh, which have uh, an if here, which uh, states uh, that your a value, the value provided to the function, the value passed to the function, is uh, in the bounds uh, of an array. If that is not true, you will get a warning and then return. So if your CPU thinks uh, that you will go into the left uh, um, branch, he will load the value in the cache. So the next time you will assess this uh, part of memory, the access uh, will get uh, a lot speedier. You will uh, get uh, your data quicker. So um, the CPU starts to load, um, start to load the value and place that in, uh, in the cache. If you go in this branch, obviously, that's uh, not a problem. Uh, you don't have to invalidate anything. You don't have to flush your, your instruction you already executed or already um, predicted, speculated, uh, speculated on. So um, if you go on the other branch, you obviously will not get your cache loaded. That's uh, obviously. So if your uh, CPU thinks that you will go into the uh, memory load branch, and you will not go this, uh, in this position, but you'll go in the other position. For example, because uh, your test uh, uh, isn't true. So for example, you are, are assessing a part of memory which is not part of this array. You will get your value, uh, you'll get your value loaded in the cache. That uh, is the, the problem. Uh, on which uh, Spectre is uh, uh, based on. So what you can do with that? You can, for example, leak the memory by using a side channel attack. So you, uh, you will start to analyze uh, if uh, array, array shoot zero, um, how much time do you need to access array shoot zero, and you, for example, need a time uh, which we'll call x. Then you start by analyzing how much time do you need to uh, load the address uh, of array shoot one, and then you and then you need a comparable time. Array 2, two for example, which was uh, the value where you are loading in the memory, need a lot, um, a lesser time to, uh, to get assessed because you have that in the cache. So you can analyze, um, you can so leak the memory by using uh, this trick. And uh, that uh, obviously is a problem for SLR because you, um, you can leak some addresses uh, of uh, some pointer function which can uh, be saved in some area of your code. And then you have uh, that your, uh, you can bypass SLR using this kind of attacks. 
another mitigation uh, which is uh, um, uh, which is present uh, in the Linux operating systems is the are the stack canaries. For example, in this case, you place uh, um, a random value, a guard value before your return address. Uh, so you can, if you smash the stack and you start to smash the stack, the, um, the function will check the, if your value is the same as uh, the start of the function. This is the start of the function. This is the end of the function. So upon a return, you will, um, your function will check if your values uh, are, uh, are being compromised. So if the values uh, was compromised, um, the function will, uh, will launch an exception uh, upon your program, so it will terminate your program. You can uh, um, habilitate uh, your stack canaries uh, using this, ca this uh, switch in your uh, compiler. So, for example, have stack protector all habilitates your function, your, um, the stack canaries in all your function uh, of your code. Um, how, how is a stack canary? Is what what uh, what is a stack canary uh, in practical terms? <coughs> a stack canaries can be a lot of things. Uh, the, um, one implementation of the stack canaries are the terminator canaries because if you stack the if you smash the stack as a uh, um, uh, as we we seen before, you uh, you will need to provide some valid input to your application because uh, if you, for example, have a get s function and you you place a zero in the memory, the the string get terminated. So get s try to load the string into your application. So if you place a zero zero value into your memory, you will get uh, your string terminated. And then you won't have the, your application continue to load memories. So if you need to provide uh, some terminator canaries, uh, that can be a problem because you need to provide a zero zero into your application, which can, which will not be loaded uh, and will not load the next address, which are return address. Some random canaries. So you need to um, to have some information leak to to retrieve the value of the canary and provide them on the function on um, on uh, on your uh, buffer your stack uh, which uh, which in which you do the stack uh, smashing or your serve canaries which are the same thing but uh, it's a random value sort to your actual data so for example the return pointer or something like that but serve canaries canaries does not protect uh, um other value of pointers, for example, if you are doing some uh, heap overflow and not a stack smashing, uh, you will need to uh, change some pointer on your, um, your heap control uh, structures on, uh, on your, your value allocated on the heap. So this kind of things doesn't, pro doesn't prevent this kind of attacks. But pointer encryption, yes. Yeah. So for example, uh, in the new ARM uh, um, V8.3 I say you will have this uh, new kind of uh, uh, encryption so you have an authentication of your pointer for example in this case is uh, you are uh, uh, encrypting your return address so your um, so the attacker need to crack your return pointer to um, to get so, uh, to hijack the, the control flow Another uh, kind of um, mitigation, which is uh, almost the, um, a kind of to test your program, uh, is uh, the F sanitizer switch on your um, uh, on your compiler. If you compile your application with the F sanitizer switch, for example, you get that your uh, your application get tested under uh, with get tested over the um, shadow stack. So you, for example, have a, your stack and then a, a copy of the stack, and then you will uh, check if the value are uh, the same. And if the value aren't the same, uh, you get an exception. This is a vulnerable program. Uh, for example, you are um, accessing some memory. In this case, uh, you have a leak because uh, you can provide some, uh, um, some negative uh, integers to this application, and that you will leak the address on the stack. And that's this, uh, and this is uh, the, um, the result of uh, uh, um, f sanitized memory corruption. Uh, in this case, uh, we have corrupted this piece of memory here, 
and the um, destruction, uh, destruction placed by the compiler. Um, I like them and then uh, um, give an exception to the processor which uh, say, okay, uh, this, uh, this text was mashed uh, and you have a corrupted memory here. So it can be a legit uh, value, something like that. And uh, you will need to check this kind of memory because you have stacked this memory here. And um, you also have uh, a father um, to do automatic tests. Uh, so, for example, the American fuzzy lop uh, is a famous father which um, provides some random input uh, to your application and uh, uh, tracks uh, which are the crashes uh, of uh, uh, the unique crashes of your applications. You have uh, the total crashes of your application, so it will save the value, um, it will save the value which uh, made your application crash. So you can, uh, for example, uh, leave it uh, with a lot of inputs, a lot of applications, and make them test. So um, that's American fuzzy lob. And then there are some advanced attacks. Uh, for example, the heap overflow, which we all don't uh, present here, integer overflow some race conditions uh, like uh, time to check to time to use the dirty cow which is uh, a famous uh, um, a famous attack uh, over uh, the linux kernel which is an integral overflow <laughs> you have also type confusions and uh, that only attacks uh, because uh, uh, for example the pack security team classifies uh, attacks uh, in three kinds of uh, um, in, in three classes for example injecting code we uh, will see, we saw um, the second injection, and that was uh, an injection of code in our application. A control flow hijacking, which are, for example, the ROP uh, um, programming technique. So you are not injecting code in your application, but you are jacking your control flow. And that's the third kind of uh, uh, attacks are data only attacks. Uh, so you are only modifying some part of your uh, application, so some variables of your application, and then you can attack some, uh, uh, some part of the code using that. Uh, the side channel attacks, for example, Spectra, Meltdown, Rohammer, which was a, a famous uh, uh, side channel attacks uh, over RAM, SROP, which is a modification of ROP, which is uh, the signaling method of the Linux operating system to, um, to be a more reliable attacks to more reliable attacks of ROP. And then obviously you have advanced mitigations like uh, Rero, which uh, made some areas of uh, dynamic load libraries read only, Pi, which is called full SLR, memory tagging, malloc of OpenBSD, for example. Uh, like the OpenBSD one, uh, hardening the BFP um, JIT interpreter. So, and obviously the PEX and GRSEC security team patches, uh, which uh, provide some, um, some improvements uh, over the, um, the mitigation we have presented. And then the uh, GFI, which is uh, um, a compiler extension to check if your control flow you are uh, you have declared in your application, you have programmed in your application, um, is respected. So if you, obviously, if you hijack your control flow, you, uh, you will get an exception by this kind of, this uh, compilation extension, and uh, that uh, the GRSEC wrap, which is, uh, um, which is something like uh, CFI and pointer authentication to your system, so, so that is. Maybe a, a little too short, yeah. Little too. <laughs> Thank you, Davide. Thank you. Okay. We have more time for questions. Uh, a lot of time for questions.